So this webinar is going to be basically some photography business tips, and it's going to be, I guess you would say, for a little bit for everyone. All right, and let me just go ahead and start advancing through here. And the first slide is basically going to talk about what we're going to be covering. All right, how do I get my black background to not look washed out? It's a question that came in. We're going to answer that. Another question was, I use a light meter, but my pictures still come out under or overexposed. Why? All right, another good question. What size studio do I need? Do I need one? I get that question a lot, and we're going to talk about that tonight. Now, how do I, how do I get a clear shot with a moving subject? Okay, there's, there's another question, very, very important question. Do I need to change my custom white balance if I change lenses? Another great question. What photography niche market should I choose? Another great question, and how do I get more clients on a budget? And that's going to be a new method that I'm going to be revealing tonight. Actually, I just discovered this about a week ago, and um, I didn't really understand uh, how it worked until, um, well, probably just after I, I heard it and I started thinking to myself, you know what? This is something that's going to, I think, change everything. And uh, you're going to want to pay attention to that one. So that's that. All right. So, Joe, what do you say we get moving along here? Okay, I'm with you. All right, here we go. So how do I get my black background to not look washed out? Joe, I know you're going to want to handle this one, so let's get right into it. Let's talk about this washed out and then the rich black. I know a lot of people are shooting on dark backgrounds, not necessarily black, but dark backgrounds, and a lot of them are getting this washed out look, and they want that rich black look. So what, what, what are we going to talk about here and why this is happening and how we can prevent this? Okay, this is from one of our students, and if the lighting looks kind of flat, now to me that says uh, even on both sides of the cheek, so that says to me that it's more or less frontal lighting, or maybe 45 degrees to the side, but that light is hitting past the child, and since the background looks relatively close, I'm sure it's within two feet, it's hitting, it's getting also some of that spill light. Um, if you use an umbrella, you're certainly going to get the spill. If you're using a softbox, then you have to change it somewhat so that it's not frontally hitting the child and the backdrop. And the second one uh, shows a rich black if you use the proper umbrella or softbox technique that we're going to show. Uh, also, it could be brought up in, you know, in Photoshop if you want to do every one of your pictures during a session like this and work extra time in Photoshop. So let's try to show you how to light them correctly the first time. And... Uh, here we can use, this happens to be an octobox, it could be anything, but we have it 90 degrees at the subject's ear, okay? So that's generally sh shooting to the side of them. And it has a grid, there's an egg crate uh, Velcroed in grid, and that acts like a direct blinder. So the light is kept exactly off of that background. There's no way that light escapes the umbrella or this uh, soft box here, off the box. It's got to go directly to the subject. We will meter that, and you'll have a perfect exposure on the child, and you will retain that deep black that you put up there in the first place. Yeah, and again, I mean, you might want to point that out real quick, this egg crate grid, and talk a little bit about that, about the directional light on that. I mean, you know, I don't know if people really understand what that is, but it's basically, it's like little tiny honeycombs. It's like a honeycomb, is actually what it is, like a, like a right, beehive right, kind right. of thing. And then that light sends it through and it blocks it out from basically straying the light, and, um, and it really controls the light. Now, you don't have to have this. It just helps keep the background, or the, um, I'm sorry, the soft box or the aqua box or, or whatever, it's going to keep it more direct and focused on where you're aiming it. I like to say, think of it like blinders on a horse, or just cut up your hands, you know, when you want to see in a snow scene, you want to see far away. You're trying to direct your eyesight and keeping it, and blocking out all, all stray, extraneous light. Exactly. And this here is the standard setup that most people are familiar with. This is a setup that I've used before, not on a black background necessarily, but on, you know, most of the, the uh, you know, the sessions. And it's, it's a standard lighting pattern. And Joe, just talk about that and, you know, why it works for other, you know, styles of, of uh, you know, portraiture with, you know, maybe if you want the background, you know, a little bit of the light spilling onto it. But in this case, we want to keep the light off of it. So just talk a little bit about this setup. Well, the last baby I said was flat lighting because both cheeks were lit the same. What we like to do and have our lighting um, more act like it's natural lighting is sculpture the face. 
And so by putting a light way over to the side, in this case 45, we're going to get nice highlights on one side of the cheek and the transition for the shadow will fall softer on the other side. Won't be dark black, but it'll be a softer. And that gives shape and modeling and it sculpts the face so that we know a nose sticks out further than a cheek. When you're flat, you don't know where any dimensions are. So we try to avoid flat lighting. But where that is good lighting for portraits of people, if you have a background too close, in this case, it looks like two feet or so, it, you're going to light it up. And if it's a color, blue or gray or red, that's okay if it has a little spill, but not okay if you want that rich black to be retained. So right. now in the next one, we're going to move this octobox to the side. Like I said, aim at their ear. You're still going to get that wraparound um, effect because most of the octobox is in front toward the camera. They are at the rear of the box. That means all that front lighting escaping will go over to past the nose and will act like a fill umbrella. It will act like a reflector on that side because that's what we call wraparound lighting. You use a large octobox, in this case 47 inches, not something small of 33, but the larger size will have that wraparound effect. You don't need a reflector on the other side. One will do the work of it. And because it's like this, it escapes past the angle of the view, the purple lines here are the camera's angle of view, but because the light is not hitting directly behind the subject, we don't see the gray background. It may be gray past them, past the camera angle, but we're going to have nice black right behind the subject. Right, and I think the the big thing here, the big point of this whole thing is, is that I think people should understand is you just want to keep the light off of the background as much as possible, and that's going to help your backgrounds from being washed out. Like Joseph, you know, we've done it before. You know, sometimes you have to do it because you're doing multiple backgrounds. You don't have time to change the lights, and you know, if you do. A big thing here is keep the subject away from the background. And we put here three to four feet. But even if you can go more, that's even better. And that's just going to be because then the light's going to be further away and it's going to you know, not spill as much on the background. But the bottom line is here is try to keep your light off your background, especially if it's a black or a dark background. Okay, now if you're trying to, you know, light the background a little bit like in a high key situation or a white background, then you would want to do the opposite. You'd want to have that light coming through and past the subject onto the background. And that's a whole nother you know, a whole other, um, you know, setup and, uh, you know, lesson. But in this case, you know, keep your, your subject away from the background. Three to four feet is a general rule, but, you know, further is better. If you have the room, it'd be better. And then what you're going to also do is you're going to capture some depth of field, some shallow depth of field, which is going to blur the background and get rid of some wrinkles. So there's a lot of benefits to having your subject just away from the background versus being on top of the background. Right. Are, you able to show, are you able to show those first two slides? Uh, it showed the gray and, and the black, and you could see all yeah, the wrinkles. Can, yep. We can go back to that without a doubt. We'll, we'll scroll right back, and right there you can see it. See the wrinkles okay. in the background, and see the little because shadow that's close. going on the child. Yeah, and the, and the, the shadows on the on the back side of the child. You know, again, if if you were to have the child away from that, you would have eliminated the shadow there. You would have eliminated all those wrinkles because then again, you're shallowed up the field. And we won't get into the whole thing. But if you have a smaller f stop too, you know, uh, you know. If you want four like and five, five, six. Four or five, six, yeah. then you know you're going to have you know a shallow depth of field in that. But we won't get into that. But right there, a simple thing is just keep your subject away from the background. It's going to help a lot of things. So let's uh, let's keep moving here, Joe. I think that was good. And then again, this is like the overall image. But now we just left that uncropped. Normally we would crop that image in. Okay, the smaller one there that's tilted. We would crop that in so you're you're not having all that dead space above them. But we wanted to show you what it should look like if you do it properly, okay? All right, so we're going to keep moving here. Question two, Joe, another one for you. I use a light meter, but my pictures still come out under or overexposed. Why? All right. Um, this particular brand is a Sekonic meter. It's an L358. But on its dome, um, they have a little black dial, and it causes the dome to go up or recede down. And for a proper reader, reading of, from your light, the dome should be fully exposed. That black outer ring should be down. And that lets the dome collect all the light that you're going to use in your studio. And so we say make sure that that's – I think it's down for um, putting back into your bag so you don't scratch the dome and, and things like that. So for transport, you put it down. But make sure when you're back in the studio and you need it, twist that little black knob and the white dome will be fully exposed. Now, the other thing is – 
people are disregarding the little the tenths. So there's always five, six, and a few tenths, uh, eight, and a few tenths. You can't ignore it. The meter is there giving it to you. So if you see, and you want an eight, F8 at your subject, and you see an F8.3, you maybe can say, okay, let me test it at F8. Look at my LCD screen. Yeah, the exposure is great. I'll call it an eight. But no way, if that thing says eight and seven tenths or, or nine tenths, that's an 11, people. You've you got to remember, those tenths are not to be ignored. Maybe at the 8.1 or 0.2 or 0.3, you can call that the regular number you see. But when you get past seven tenths, that goes to the next higher value. In the case of eight, F11. So if you didn't go to F11, your picture will be overexposed. So it's important to read that last tenth and, and put that into your evaluation. And the last thing is some people, it sounds simple, but if your ISO is 200 in the camera, make sure the meter says 200. Because if it says 400, because it slipped, the dial changed, or you were using it the other day, and the ISO on the meter is 400, that will give you another stop increase. So now that 11 will be a 16. Okay? So... Be careful. It's a little thing, but make sure the camera and the meter match and watch that tenth of the uh, stop there in the meter reading. Yeah, it won't always are... say, yeah, it won't always say 8, 8.0. It always says 8 point something tenth. If it's one or two or three, you can say that's an eight, but that's what I want the point to be across. Yeah, and I think right here, I mean, three simple tips to follow, and they seem basic, you know, but you know what? Sometimes it's the simple things that we miss. And, you know, again, like I was telling you, Joe, when we were putting this together, I'm like, you know, it's a good idea, too. Maybe you got a buddy of yours or, you know, or maybe you have someone at the local camera shop that you can go and say, hey, can I borrow your meter and kind of, like, you know, test the two of them and make sure that you're getting the reading that yours is getting. Maybe yours isn't calibrated right anymore, you know, or maybe it's just old or, you know what I mean? So, you know, you want to make sure that it's, it's – it's doing its job, but then also you want to make sure that you're doing your job and setting everything properly. I think the big one, though, the big takeaway here is the round up and round down because a lot of people, like you say, you know, if you don't do that, you're going to be a stop up or a stop down, and that, that could be a huge thing. You know? So you, you really want to be careful with that and just be conscious of that. And the other thing I want to say is if you're watching this and you don't have a light meter as of right now, maybe you weren't ready before. Maybe you're doing the old method where you look at the screen and you get to see you know, and you get to modify that way, and that's great, and you can do that. And I you know, say, hey, if you don't have the money to, to get a meter, then do that. Don't let it stop you. But if your first thing that you should really be concentrating on getting, you know, obviously, you know, a, a, a light would be, you know, number one too. But basically, the meter is going to really solve a lot of problems and making it so you don't have to guess. It's going to be there. And, um, you know, put that on your Christmas list if it isn't there already. All right. So I think that's a great, uh, great tip there, especially the round up, round down. But real basic stuff there that you can, you know, definitely make sure of. Maybe you want to even have that little checklist here. You know, once I give you these slides, you can print that out and you can have it with you. All right, so let's move on. Question three, another great one. I love this one, Joe. This is great. What <laughs> I, know, I know what's coming. I know you, you know what's coming because we put these slides together and we just kept having a lot of fun with this next part. All right, so what size studio do I need? And do I need one? Now, let me just say before we get going here, um, do you need one? I say no. Would it be nice to have one? Absolutely. You know, some people think that I have to have one with 12-foot ceilings and it's got to be 30-foot long, you know, and, and we're going to show you right here that it, it doesn't necessarily have to be that big. And number two, you don't really have to have one to get started. So don't let it hold you back, all right? So let's move on here, Joe. This is going to be fun. So guess where this was taken. And I'm going to give everyone like 10 seconds to kind of think about it. Select your answer. A, a bathroom. B, a kitchen. C, a minivan. Or D, a tool shed. Okay? I want everybody to take a second. Okay, like at the commercial, if you're at the Super Bowl and they do this and they say, when you come back, we'll tell you. Well, that's what we're going to do right now. Mm -hmm. All right? So here we go. All right? We're just about ready. Make your selection. Hurry up. Make your selection. All right. Here we go. Let's see if you're right. Okay, I'm a drum roll, Joe. Give me, give me a little drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, here we go. Ready? The answer is C, the minivan. Who would have known? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, this was submitted by one of our students on our forum, and uh, it's, it was Nakia, and uh, you know, it was it was great because she did that exact same thing on the forum. She's like, "Hey, where was this shot?" And she she didn't even tell everybody right away. She let it go a couple days, 
and kind of get the suspense going. And uh, but again, look at this right here. All right, I'm going to bring my my mouse down here so you can see it. My name. And basically what that I'm going to do in here is just pointing. Look at back here. This right here is just a curtain rod that she strung across there. We've got a black uh, sheet of some sort or even a background. I don't, I'm not even quite sure what it is. She's, she has a, a wooden chair, probably out of the kitchen. And then she's got a two-foot uh, softbox and a really inexpensive strobe and a really inexpensive light stand. And that's it. And a minivan. All right? So let me just show you the next slide. So, again, use what you have. There's a full shot of it. That's a minivan. That could be a Windstar or a Kia. Or, <laughs> I don't know. But that's a, that's a mobile studio, all right? But she didn't let it hold her back. You know, she, she went and did this and this. And, you know, who knows? She could travel around and do headshots for people, right? So have they, they actually, have you know, will travel. Yeah. I mean, we, have, we, do, we do have people that are traveling studios. They actually, have, I, know, I know one student that actually has uh, an RV, and they, they – basically converted it to a studio. So you walk into this RV and it's a full studio. Okay. And they do stuff just like this head shots, you know, three quarter shots, you know, and they have fun with it. They have costumes, all that stuff. So, you know, don't let it hold you back. All right. But basic strobe, 24 inch softbox, basic stand, a closet rod, black sheet and a wood chair. And that's it. Oh yeah. And the minivan. All right. So, I mean, if you don't have a minivan, you know, you might have something else, but it doesn't have to be this. I'm just giving the example that this here, the, the back of that, the opening of that is probably what, about four feet, maybe five feet at most, and maybe four or five foot tall. You know, it's not big. Okay. So you could do it in a closet if you had to. So don't let it hold you back. That's not an excuse. And I know what other people are thinking too is, well, and we had this question, we were going to answer this question, but then we decided not to because we didn't have enough room, but we'll do it briefly right here. You know, I had someone that emailed me and said, Scott, you know, what if I set up in my living room? Will I still be able to charge professional prices? Well, let me ask you something. If you go to a full-fledged studio that's got this humongous space and you know that it looks really nice and you, you go there and you have a terrible experience and you have terrible pictures, okay, but then they come to your little studio that's in your living room, okay, and you set it up and you get gorgeous shots and it's beautiful and you were really good with your kids or really good with their pets, who, who are they going to want to go to? So if they're going to pay you whatever – because you're giving them the results that they want. That's the bottom line. Don't worry about looking the part. Yes, it looks nice to have a nice camera and have the nice lights, and you can still have that, but you don't have to have fancy studio with crown moldings and, you know, chair rail going all around it with all this embossing, and you don't have to have all that. You just have to have results, okay? And that's really what you need to focus on. And this is the perfect example. And, you know, right here you can see, and I put that, simple and beautiful. I mean, look at that. Look at the beautiful lighting. I mean, it's, it's gorgeous, you know. And then here was the, the other one, just to kind of give you the, the whole thing the catch, again, you know. The, the catch lights, the beautiful transition from the highlight side to the shadow side. You see this beautiful face, um, the hand leading up to it, a nice tilt of the head. Um, this is as professional as you get in any studio. Why would you say, I'm not a professional studio yet? I don't demand professional prices? Fully. Exactly, exactly. And, and you can see down, down by her arm, she took the, the sheet and rolled it over top of the chair. That's a great, I mean, great idea. You know? so, and let me just give you another example that she did here, and this was a, of another one. And again, like Joe, like we were talking about this, not only is this a great, you know, great lighting, and you know, it's got a nice rich black background, but... What, what is it, too? It's, it's got great composition, okay? It's got great composition. And like we were saying, Joe, even the white shirt acted as a reflector and added some, you know, let me bring my, my mouse down. You can see right here, hey, don't beat me there. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you want to come out here and fight? We'll go out here and fight out here. Come on out, Joe. Come on. Come on. Here. You're, you're bigger than me. <laughs> but anyway, you know, so, so right here, you know, you can see it. You, you can see this light from over here, okay? It was hitting here and reflecting back. And that's exactly what a reflector does. I mean, this is a great example of that. So, you know, I think, it's, I think this is just awesome, and Nikita did a great job. Uh, it's just awesome. So I wanted to share that with you guys. I hope it was a lot of fun there, too, with our little thing. And I wonder how many got it right. I want, you know what? I want people to email me, tell me who got that right. Okay? And don't lie. <laughs> All right, right. Let, me, let, me, let me point out oh, one other thing. Go back, uh, go back. I just want to point out on the pose. This is... Uh, considered a masculine pose. His head is tilted to the high shoulder. A feminine pose, many of you have heard me say, you would leave the lady's head tilt to the lower shoulder. So you don't want to shoot a masculine subject 
with his head leaning to the lower sh shoulder. We don't, you know, we're not going to turn him into a lady. So um, this is a good pose this way, with the head going to the higher shoulder. That's the masculine pose. Yeah, and that's a great point. You know, the other thing I want to point out too, jokes. I know people. There's probably some people that are going to be saying this, and I would too. It's like, okay, you guys just showed me how to shoot on a black background and not get got it so the you know the, the light spills in the background. But this is kind of hard to do. How how did she do this here? And I think I know the answer. But why don't you go ahead and uh, and tell me your? Well, she's right. shooting into basically she's shooting into a cave. I mean, if you've got tinted windows and that backdrop, I'm sure she's killing all light coming. You know, if she had opened a back window she might have gotten separation light or might not have. So she, she did good uh, with the skill she had in the minivan. Now, not all vans are, are built the same, you know, um, so your mileage will vary. But all you can do is see what's on the back of your screen and then a little Photoshop if you had to make that a little blacker. But basically, the text light, can you blow that up, uh, Scott? Yeah, let me do that. Uh, let's see here if I remember how to do it now. Yes, I do. And then let me just move it over here. Okay. These are square set, uh, um, catch lights that denotes that it was taken with a softbox. If they were round, that would tell us an umbrella. So um, perfectly natural. It looks like this kid was next to a big picture window. That's why it's square. If they were round, it would look like he was outside in the sun. And that's, that's what the catch lights tell you about a picture. But looking at it blown up like you have no idea. You, we, we've shown you where it was really taken. But this is studio quality. She can demand studio prices. She doesn't have to cheapen it because she was in a van. And she pulled up to the client's home. And maybe it was 50 miles away. Can they have any other photographer come out that far? Probably not. So these are all the benefits you have when you, like I said, have van, will travel. Yeah, no, it's great. Okay, so let's keep moving along here. Okay, so again, do I need one? Do I need a studio? And the answer is no. But having one is definitely going to be more flexible. I mean, obviously, you'll have you know more range. You'll have you know obviously you can have more backgrounds loaded up. And I mean, there's a lot a lot of flexibility that comes with having a studio. And yes, you should work to having a studio. I mean, you can start with a 12 by 12, a 12 by 20, 10 by 20, whatever you want or whatever you have, you should use. It doesn't have to be huge. And the bottom line is don't let it stop you from getting started. There's so many people out there, and Joe and you and I talked about it, that say, you know, I really want to get everything perfect before I go and start charging for it. But why? Why do you want to do that? I know you want to give a great product, and you will. But the only way that you're going to learn is to go out there and start doing it and start learning from these mistakes, okay? And like I told you, Joe, what did I tell you? It's not a problem. It's a challenge. It's not a problem. Don't look at these as problems. Look at these as challenges. And when you challenge yourself, you're going to strive to do better, and you're going to strive to, to get it right, okay? So get out of your comfort zone. Get out there. Start getting some feedback. Start getting some examples. I mean, why do they have someone that's, you know, studying to be a doctor be an intern for, for you know, a certain amount or, you know, a resident, you know? The reason why they do it is because you got to get that experience, all right? And that's really what you got to do here. So, you know, I know I'm kind of ranting on that, but it's so important. People wait and wait and wait for what? You know, because you have to look like you're a professional. You know, you'll build the confidence as you keep, you know, growing. Okay, and uh, you know, it'll just it'll just keep moving forward when you keep getting these results. So anyway, let's move along here. So question number four: How do I get a clear shot with a moving subject? Another big one. Okay, and some people it might be obvious, and some people it might not be. So we're going to cover all of these. All right. So let's go to the next slide. And again. Here's a shot, and this one here was taken by Elisa, and it was in the summertime with my little one, Kayla, and, uh, you know, she had a lot of fun. She's brought the camera out and, you know, froze the action, froze the action. I mean, it's, they're, they're great shots, okay? And uh, let's, let's see what I did here. I showed you exactly what we shot in that, okay? So I took the camera data that was in the, uh, the camera, and I basically gave it to you, okay? So it was, the, the shutter speed was higher. Okay, it was 640. Okay, it was a, a 64th of a second. Okay, so now you have also the ISO, which I think is another important factor, was 250. Okay, and but it was in shutter priority. Okay, meaning that she set basically setting the shutter and then letting everything else kind of fall into place. All right, so that's that's one of the main things that people need to understand is you need a higher, uh, you know, shutter speed. Okay, that's one way. We're going to talk about other ways too. But let me just show you another shot, give you another example. This one here, she wanted it even a little bit more crisp. And she went and she wanted to be able to lock in things even more. Like we were, and we'll show you in this next, this next slide after this one that sometimes blurry is good, 
you know, the motion, showing the motion is good, but not the entire picture, just parts of it. But this one here, um, 1600 was the shutter speed, and then 400 was the ISO. But again, great shot. And the other thing I want to point out real quick, Joe, and I know we've talked about this before, mm -hmm. was the, the aperture. Um, you can see the aperture um, was at uh, 485. Uh, basically, what that does and what that allows is you can see the background is blurred out, okay? If she shot that at F8, F11, that background is going to be sharper, and you're not going to get that nice, like almost like the, the uh, subject is popping off of the background. So yeah, well, that's, that's, just that, that's what happens when you go with a high shutter speed. Inherently, your f-stop will go to the lower value, so that's good. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so moving along. Now, here's one of Joe's shot. Now, who is this again? It's Robert Cray, right? Yes, Robert Cray Blues Band. Yeah, Joe, uh, Joe shot this one here, and he's sharing it with us. But this, this illustrates exactly what we're talking about, about allowing blur, because sometimes it's okay. It's going to show the action. And, uh, and like I said, I mean, sometimes it's good. Well, that up right here, so you can, can see, see its face. Face is very oh, sharp. Okay. Yep. Hold on. Let me let me zoom that in for you. Oops, that one too small, Joe. <laughs> there we go. Let's bring that up. Okay. This is, I caught the peak of action. He was just singing. He backed away from the mic, so it's not he's not eating it in his face. I've got uh, emotion, all the uh, impact of his song. And then slide down where he's strumming the guitar, uh, Scott. And I've got a little bit of blur. The other hand is sharp on the frets because it's not moving as fast. And now we've showed in a two-dimensional image, we've showed some motion as if it was a video or a clip. Yeah, and that's no, how we it do it. Great. It's re really good. And, uh, and like we said, I mean, sometimes the motion is good. So don't worry about, you know, always having it like that. But, yeah, if, if you don't have it right and the whole picture is blurry, that's a different story. And I think that's what the question was that, that came in was I have a studio and how do you get to capture, you know, kids when they're running, you know, back and forth and not sitting still. And basically your best thing there is going to be, you know, your, your higher shutter. Now, not all the way to 1,600. I would say more or less like, you know, what would you say, Joe, between like 120 and 250? Yeah, if you want to stop with outdoor ambient lighting as you've shown with the kids in the sun. But now, if you want to stop motion and you're in a studio, it requires flash. And right, we're going to talk about you, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here, here it is right here. Here's an, another example from Joe. Um, and that's actually a balloon with a dart. And this wasn't digitally done with, a, you know, with Photoshop. And Joe, talk about that, about how you captured that and how you stopped that dart and it wasn't necessarily a high shutter speed because look at it, it was only one twenty fifth of a second. Yeah, this was at one of our workshops. We used uh, a high speed s speed light real close to the balloon and the, the camera has a shutter speed. Probably most cameras go up to 4,000, 8,000 if you look at the dial. Uh, we keep our sync speed for flash at 250, okay, or 200, whatever our sync is for our camera brand. This allowed me to be at 125, so it's not a fast shutter. That dart was thrown to pop that balloon. And before that balloon fell to the floor and flattened itself, deflated, it's got roundness. It's still in the effect of being deflated. And my flash was a high shutter speed. All flashes have higher than 8,000. Most of them do. 8,000 is on your camera. But the, sh the flash can have 13,000, 8,000, whatever. And that's what froze this dart perfectly, and it shows that it's in deep enough to pop that balloon, and the balloon hadn't collapsed yet. My picture was so fast, it didn't get a chance to fall down on the ground. No, that was great, and it's a great example because, like you said, Joe, flash stops the, the action. And, and like I said to you uh, when we were putting this together, if you think about it with other you know, people that have like a point-and-shoot camera, have you ever taken a picture with a point-and-shoot camera and then you go ahead and you, you, uh, you, know, you take your shot and then you, know, you, you don't use any flash and all of a sudden you notice that it's blurry. But then the minute you put flash on it, it makes the image sharp and it makes it clear. And the reason is because it's stopping action. All right? So it's not letting that ambient light in and you know, all that good stuff. But anyway, flash is also important to stop action, okay? Obviously because it's, it's uh, capturing the image and then placing it on the CCD and it's and tapping it quick, you know, quickly, especially if it's that, you know, if you're only shooting here, your shutter speed at 1 25th of a second. So it's a great point. And I think people need to understand that. And it's, again, basic stuff, but yet not. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's hard to wrap your head around this stuff. All right. 
So that does that, okay? So again, let's talk about using flash versus continuous lights. Basically, continuous lights meaning ones that are on all the time, and then using flashes the ones that fire when your camera fires. And, uh, you know, basically, studio flashes will stop most movement at high shutter speeds. Continuous lights require slower shutter speeds, obviously, because we've got to let more light in, so we're going to have a lower shutter, and then it's going to also show the motion blur a lot easier. So um, I think, uh, you know, Joe is dead on using flash. I mean, you know, continuous lights, if you, if you have to, if you wanted to get a certain look, maybe, um, yes, but I would say use flash, uh, you know, strobes, and do not mix the two. Anything else on that, John? No, you, you said it. Um, yeah, these uh, continuous lights that people are buying and they're putting in their husband's work lamps, you know, those reflector uh, things that they use over their car, that's only one bulb, and that's barely 100 watts. And we can have a studio Air and B 800, which is 320 watts. So you see that you'd have to either build a bank of these fluorescents, uh, which could get warm or, or whatever, but you're never going to, and the shutter speed is to get it, 250 at f8 like a flash you'd have to use an awful lot of these continuous light bulbs on the set yeah you get hot and i think it's dangerous if you're using those now, i do sell continuous lights for a studio which are supposed to be a little bit better than those uh, you know the, the uh what am i trying to say there those little squirrely looking ones um, yeah well the, the lamps the lamps for those like westcott is 84 dollars each and it's a bank of five that go inside the softbox so you yeah. can see that you're already up to 900 dollars for these people already yeah, and you can get a good Alien B basic like for two and a quarter, and you can go up to the B800, and what are they going for? A little over 300? No, 279. Oh, 279. So they're under 300. So it's even better. So, okay, so we're not going to keep going on this, but using flash versus continuous light, we would say go with flash, um, especially, uh, you know, if you're, if you're doing this professionally and you want to get those professional results, I would use a flash. And you'll, you'll, you'll see too that you're not going to be playing around with trying to get things right, especially with continuous lights, how you have to really uh, tweak everything and get a lot of light. Uh, you have to have, have it really bright. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on. Okay, so question number five. Another question, Joe, for you. Do I need to change my custom white balance if I change lenses? Another great question. Uh, oh. Well, custom, custom white balance, uh, usually we'll use a test target. Oh, that's me, Scott. Um, yes, we'll use a test target to lock in our white, gray, and black dark values. And if we do that on the back of the camera, it has a custom setting, and it, it allows you to shoot a test target, say you like the picture you see, and it, it accepts it for all the used at that uh, location. Now, um, why, why do we use a custom? Because the camera has a sun, it has a fluorescent tube, it has a tungsten tube flashing, it's got a house with a shade. Those are all built in from the factory in Japan. They don't know what they are, conditions in Chicago, in Florida, in New York. I mean, the light is different. I get the southern hemisphere light down in Florida, and you guys get a northern hemisphere light. So the color is different. It's either bluer or more orange. Or, so when you color balance and you use a test target and the case of a lens, I, you, they tell you to zoom in to the target. Well, I have refined that a little bit, and I back out a little to show a little skin. So when I'm doing my adjusting at the computer, I get to see white, black, and gray, and I get to see skin tone that looks correct. I'm not too red, not too dark, or yellow, or any. So all that gets balanced with a custom setting. So it's regardless of the lens. I mean, if your lens is too wide and you're including too much area, all that white back there. And remember, your meter wants to find gray. It'll see all that gray and uh, that white and try to make it gray. So when you give it a test target with none values, what is black, what is gray, what is white, and in my case, what is skin tone? And I'm in a dark shirt, so I'm not throwing off the meter. So the lens doesn't matter. It, it's only if you're too wide, you may be including too much in the scene. You know, so you, don't, you want to include for this test target. Yeah, or a great exactly. card or whatever you were taught, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think the picture of you right there with the test target is a perfect example. You're showing some skin, you're showing your, your clothing, and then you're also showing the background that you're shooting up against. So, you know, 
it's got all the elements right there. And then that, like you said, black, gray, and white is what the camera is going to see. And then it's going to do its own configuring. Now, if you don't have a test target, don't think you can't do this. You can, uh, you know, usually if you go in and you shoot on the flash setting, if you're using flash, then that's going to give you pretty good results. Just don't go on auto because auto is going to basically guess. Okay, but if you're using Flash, let it know you're using Flash. If you're using, you know, uh, sun outside, go to sun. You know, if it's cloudy, use cloudy. You know, use the settings that they're giving you, but, the, again, the foolproof way is to get one of these little test targets. I mean, how much are these targets, Joe? How much are these things costing these days? This one's a 14-inch, and uh, b and sells it for $39. How much? $39. $39. Bucks. You know, so, I mean, it's a great investment, I think, because it's going to get it right every time. And then what you are going to want to do is you're going to want to do this per session, though, because, you know, things change in the elements as, as far as, like, in your studio. If you're using a different color background, you've got a different subject with different skin, co uh, skin tone, different clothing, you're going to want to do another one. So this way here, the camera is going to be good, okay? And it's all going to be set up for you. So I think that's well, all we really need point. to do on that one. Well, one fine point. I just want to mention, and I don't often do this, um, that is straight out of the camera. Now, I usually don't show my shots straight out of the camera. I usually do some post. But this is to show you that when you're dead on with that test target and you made a custom balance in your camera, did not use the presets that they gave you, the skin tone, everything here is perfect. That is exactly my black and gray shirt with blue uh, lines in it. That's exactly what the target looks like. And that's my Italian skin. So that's exactly. straight out of the camera. <laughs> exactly. And just to let everybody know, look at Joe's head right there. That's going to be a cartoon character pretty soon. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> we're going we're gonna, to, as a joke, we're going to have a couple of cartoon characters made of us to put on some of our podcasts and stuff. So we're going to have we, some fun we, with it. We want, I always say make light in your friend and make flash. And, and, and Scott, what Scott's intimating is this is not stodgy. Have fun, folks. Have fun with your clients. Make them enjoy the session. It's not going to a dentist's office or a doctor. Make everyone just feel at home. Have maybe some drinks, coffee or juice or whatever. Have candy for the kids. You know, tell them, oh, after you do this sitting, you, you'll get candy. But make everything fun. And that's what Scott and I are trying to impart here. Yeah. I mean, I mean we don't want a boring uh, teacher or a boring class. So, you know, we're going to have some fun with it. And I'm going to put a cartoon character together for Joe. <laughs> All right. Let's move on. All right, question number six. What photography niche slash market should I choose? Okay, and this is a great question. I get asked this a lot, and I also see people that are going in the direction that they really shouldn't be for what they're going after. Most people that email me are in, they're basically getting started because they want to either supplement their income or they want to leave their job and start a new career. And all of these are coming at you. Now, some people love taking landscape shots. Some people, you know, they might want to be the paparazzi. They might want to be a newspaper type magazine, you know, photographer. And that's fine, you know, but you really need to go after where people are going to be coming back to you time and time again. Uh, and also you want to go into markets where it's easier to, to enter and to basically get noticed. And that's what we're going to talk about. But that's why I just threw a bunch of them up there because there's a lot of different ones. There's even more that I'm putting up here, okay? But I'm going to give you a little checklist that you can go over and kind of think about these things before you decide if you haven't already decided. Or maybe you're doing weddings and maybe you're doing some pet photography and maybe you're doing some children's photography and you're doing families and you're doing seniors. Okay, that's not necessarily good. Okay, yes, you're getting a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but you're not being known as the expert, the senior photography expert, the pet photography expert. Okay, so we'll get into that in a minute. But basically, here's some questions to ask yourself. Okay, the big questions checklist, I call it. Okay, so how many people need this service? It's a big question right there. Okay, are you going to basically go and just do businesses like, uh, you know, an electrician or a plumber because they need an ad put in the paper and you do that once for every two years? not really going to, it's not going to withstand the long term, okay? Um, are they passionate about pictures, okay? That's another big one. Now, we know that moms and dads are very passionate about their children's pictures. At least the moms are, okay? I know the dads are sometimes, but from my experience, it's usually a, a job, a chore to get the dad there, and when he's there, he's usually not that happy, okay? <laughs> Especially if the family shot, because it's done on maybe once every 10 years for the father. Um, but Usually the mom is coming in all the time to get pictures taken of their, of their babies as they grow up, all right? And that leads me into what's the life cycle of a client. And this is big. If you took pictures of a little infant, okay, we've done, you know, babies as little as three weeks old, 
Okay. And then we've taken them all the way up to the current age. Like right now, some kids are going into ninth and 10th grade. I mean, it, it's just crazy. You, you could have maybe had someone that came in that was seven years old and now they're graduating high school. So you, you've gotten to take pictures all the way through their life. And then you get to take them as their senior. And like Joe and I were talking and who knows, you might even shoot their wedding. Okay. So that's their really children. Think about. Well, their oh, children. They're... Exactly. It could just keep repeating the cycle. So again, pet photography, same thing, similar. Because, you know, people usually have pets, and if the pet, pet, if the pet passes away, uh, you know, they're obviously going to probably get a new pet, and they're going to do the same thing because they're passionate and, they're, you know, their, their pet is their, their child, all right? So you really want to think about that. You know, I think of a wedding photographer, and I say a wedding photographer could be good. You make a lot of money with wedding photography, okay? But the other thing is, is if you're not set up to where you're a wedding photographer slash family photographer, it might be hard to do that or be known as that. Um, if I was going to be the wedding photographer, I might want to make that my main bread and butter and be the expert. Because let's face it, if you do weddings, uh, you can make a lot of money doing a wedding on a weekend, you know, and from there, you might not want to do a family portraiture, you know. Okay, don't think you have to be doing everything along the lines just because your, your clients need it. It might be good to have a relationship with a family photographer if you're a wedding photographer and refer business back and forth to each other. That might not be a bad thing, okay. But Yes, if you enjoy weddings and if you enjoy family photography, then yes, do them both. Be a master at both. But all I'm saying is when you're first starting out, you really need to think about what you're passionate about. And that's what the next question is. Are you passionate about this market? If you're a new mom, you're passionate about pictures of your little baby. Okay? If you're a new pet owner or even just a pet owner, you're passionate about your pet's pictures. Okay? So you want to just make sure that there's, you know, you've got people that are passionate about what you're doing or what you're supplying the service for. Okay. And uh, let me let me, let me yeah, add one ahead. point. If, if you're passionate about tennis or you're passionate about golf, maybe you can go set something up at the at the clubhouse. Or, or you know, these are people that you play with and they know you, and you can start to do their tournaments or their donations for uh, uh, events that they're going to have for raffles or whatever. I mean, these are things. A slowly slow way to get into it, but this is what you're passionate about. So you'll do good at things you like. You hated going to a job every day that you didn't like. That's why you wanted to change careers or you put up with it for other reasons. But this is a job now where I say to people, I'm going to have a camera in my hand until I die. And because I've been doing this now for 34 years, the passion has not waned one bit. And I always find new ways. And now I'm helping others to, to learn my passion and to learn what I've gained over the years. So it's, it, you got to have this passion and desire. Yes, you do. And the other thing is, is you're always usually passionate about your equipment and about everything that's new that's coming on. I mean, think about it. When we first started, it was, it was film, and then now it's the digital. And what a difference. And what's going to be in the next generation? We don't know, you know. But all I know is it's fun riding this wave of technology. So moving along, that brings me into the next thing, because that is the technology, Twitter and Facebook, right? Everybody has the new craze, right? So do these people hang out on Facebook? And I'm kind of kidding about that, but I'm really not, because if these people are hanging out on Facebook, your pictures are going to get passed around, and people are going to see them, because now they have these little like buttons. I don't know if you've seen them, and you hit like, and then all of a sudden it goes on their wall, and then everybody sees it of their friends, and then if they like it, then it just, it's a virally, um, it's, it's a viral machine, that can just spread very easily. And right now, 90% of the things that are on Facebook are picture related. Okay. Everybody's sharing pictures. Okay. And what I'm saying is, is if you are in the photography market, you are capturing pictures, right? And then people are usually going to want to show their Christmas card or, you know, their senior uh, pictures of their daughter and they're going to want to show this stuff off. So it's a great way to do it. Now, I could do a whole other webinar on this, but if you had a blog or any, any, uh, any you know, website, which you should, you, know, you can install a little like button on your page. And then when you get people over to your page, they can like your page because their kid is on your page and it can just virally spread. So, okay, like I said, I'm, I'm kidding about that because everybody's on Facebook, but I'm really serious. You, know, you really want to consider that because that's a huge thing right now. And I don't think it's going away anytime soon. And when, when I show you what I'm going to show you here very soon, about this new thing, it, it's again, it's something that is just new, but you can just see this is just the tip of the iceberg, and marketing is just is going to just go crazy on Facebook, and if you use it properly, um, it can be a great way to get more clients, but also a great way to keep in touch with your clients and let them see you uh, as you are, which is, a, which is a huge thing in marketing. So let's move on. Uh, 
Okay, and here it is again, jack of all trades, master of none. You've probably heard that. Whatever market you choose, you want to be an expert. People always want to go to the best. They don't want someone that's a foot surgeon to do heart, open heart surgery. Okay, it's the same idea. So pick something that you want to be good at and that you can be good at and do it and master it. Okay, and then from there, you can move forward. And then some more questions to ask yourself. Can you see yourself doing this for a long time? Okay, is this something you're just going to do this year just to try to get something going and then you're going to branch off? If it is, if you're okay with it, if you have a plan, then do it. But I say try to go for something that you're going to be able to build against and then you know, move forward with it. It's going to make your life a lot easier. Again, do you know about this market and can you relate to it? Same thing. Are you passionate about it? If you, if you are and you can relate to it, a great example, and I illustrated it here for you, pet owners know animals and will relate really well, right? Well, they will usually have a better result because the clients are going to notice this and you're going to get, you know, the clients are going to see it in how you act, but also in the results. So you also want to enjoy working every day. And if you're passionate about it and if you know about it, it's going to make your job a lot easier. So just a little, uh, a little side note there for you. All right. So moving along, I mean, we're past the 830 mark here, Joe. We're heading to 10 and 9 here. It looks like we're going to be just about cutting in, into the hour, but we might have to go a few minutes over. And if everybody's cool with that, we'll do it. Um, question number seven, we're going to start getting into it right now. And this is the, the, uh, the meat of the marketing portion um, that I was talking about and how to get more clients on a budget. And it's a question I get asked a lot. I get asked this question a lot. I did a survey probably about uh, six months now ago and I asked people what they wanted to learn about. They want to learn about marketing. Did they want to learn about um, lighting, you know, posing, Photoshop, you know, what was it that they wanted to learn about? And 80% of people wanted to know more about marketing. And you know what? I like that because I think that you should know a lot about marketing. Lighting, you really need to know a lot about lighting too. And really you need to know lighting first because when you have good lighting, you have good portraits and then you can market the heck out of them. All right. So that's really how it works. So uh, you, you really want to know your marketing and you really want to love it and you want to be passionate about it because without marketing, you're not going to get your stuff seen and you're not going to get clients and you know, the whole thing. So let's move forward here. Okay. So here's the first method that I came up with for you, okay? And this came to me just the other day because I did this, okay? I didn't do this exact offer, but I was at a Christmas tree farm, and I seen the potential here, okay? So basically, I went to cut down the tree with the family, all right? We went, we go to this place. We've been there, you know, probably three, four years now, and we went with a bunch of friends, too. And uh, we went there, and it was just crazy, the amount of people that were there, families. It was just crazy, all right? And it was a whole production. You drove in, uh, you know, you drove in this windy road that went on a farm. They had a tractor that had a hay wagon, actually two hay wagons. They dragged you off into the field. You cut your tree down. They loaded it up for you. You brought it back. They, you know, they put the, the bagging on it. They, uh, you know, they had reindeer there. They had Santa Claus there. They had hot cocoa. They had hot donuts. It was just festive. It was just awesome, right? But they didn't have a photographer, okay? They did not have a photographer there. So a simple way to do this, and I put JVs up there, so you, that, the people out there that don't know what a JV is, it's joint venture. It's basically a partner. It's someone that you want to go and do business with and network with. Very important and very powerful, okay? Because you can kind of use each other, other's leverage in, in getting more clients and building relationships with other people, okay? And usually it doesn't cost you anything. All right, so number one, offer to give a free 8x10 to each family who books a session. You can have that right out there. Hey, pick up this, you know, your, a, a nice, you know, postcard that you have made or a flyer and basically say, hey, bring this into your, your shoot and we'll give you a free 8x10 with a free city, okay? And that's been being done for years and it works. That's why it's been being done for years, all right? Number two, offer to take candid shots of families with tree or with the tree and post it to your blog. And, and basically this here isn't even for you to say, hey, look, I got this great camera. I'm going to take a picture of you so you buy it. This isn't, that isn't what that is. This is about building a relationship with someone and, and creating some goodwill, which I think a lot of people aren't doing. So you're going to have your free 8x10s there, but you're also going to be standing around. So why not be there and say, hey, you want me to take a picture of your family right there with you? And I'll put it up on my blog and you can go check it out and you can have it. You can just download it. And it's not even going to be a full-size image. You're just going to give them the web image so they can share it on what? Facebook. All right, so you can have your little logo in the left-hand corner if you want. They may say, can you use my camera and take one too? Sure, no problem. You're not doing this to make any money on that picture. You're just doing it to be a good person. It's the same thing. It's, you know, we were walking in Disney World not too long ago, and uh, someone came up to me and said, hey, would you mind taking a picture of me and my girlfriend? You know, I don't know this guy, but he didn't have another person there to take the picture. So I said, of course. 
I didn't say, hey, you know, I want money. I just did it. If you do that, it's not going to take you anything but time. You go home, you upload them on your blog or your, or your, uh, your website. I would prefer a blog because then people can leave comments. Uh, again, another webinar. Uh, but, you know, basically from there, you're creating goodwill, and people know that. And they're going to take your 8x10 free 8x10, and they may come, they may not. Okay? So then you want to offer a picture with Santa and email them to the blog ad address again. The same thing. If there's a Santa there, if there's not, you say to the JV partner, the, the, the uh, business owner, hey, why don't you get a Santa here, and I'll come here, and I'll take pictures with them, and then I'll just we'll give away a free picture for everybody. Okay? It doesn't have to be even a physical picture. This isn't going to cost you anything but time. You put it up on your blog. Okay? Really simple. Uh, and then, again, the fourth one, and I've talked about this, and I don't know how many of you are doing it, but you really need to do it, is have a contest. Have a free session. Or, you know, maybe have a free 20 by 30. Give something away of real value. It will benefit you. Trust me. If you do this right here, it will benefit you. But the problem is, is we learn all these techniques, and we don't do them. And then we say, do you have any more? Got any more ideas? Well, you need to implement the ideas that have already been presented to you. Okay, I've given out the getting customers report before, and I'm sure you, all of you have gotten it because you're here tonight. Okay, go through that again and implement it. All right, and you'll be amazed when you see the results. And you know what? Don't look at it as if not if it doesn't work for you the first time that it was a failure or that it was you know it just didn't work. You know, try again. Okay, because it's going to open another door up. And Joe and I were talking about that today. You know, when you try something, you may come up with you know an issue. I don't call it a problem. I call it a challenge. And then from there, you get around the challenge, and usually another door opens up. All right, so that's that, all right? Long-winded answer there and all this, but mm -hmm. I really want to get that point across, okay? You know I'm passionate about this because I'm telling you that you just need to go out there and do something and do it, okay? So, again, why would businesses want to do this? Well, they're going to create attention and they're going to add value to their customers and their clients for nothing, all right? If, they're, if they can go ahead and promote this on a flyer in the newspaper or they can do it in a magazine or wherever they're advertising and say, hey, we're going to have a professional photographer there that's willing to take your pictures for free, okay? And they're going to give away an 8x10 in a free session and they'll take pictures with Santa. I mean, do you think people are going to come and they're going to recognize you? I do, okay? So that's something that you really want to consider and the business owner is going to want to do this. It's going to be a no-brainer for them. They're going to add value and it's not costing them anything. Okay, but you have to make the first step, and you've got to contact these people. They're also going to receive real value. They're going to get the free 8x10, okay, the customer is, their customer. Not your customer, their customer, because they came from them, all right? And they can share the images from your blog on Facebook and Twitter, like I said before, okay? But important note here, it doesn't cost the business anything, zero, okay? It doesn't cost them a penny, and that's huge. You don't want it to cost them anything, okay? So what are you going to gain from this? You're going to gain exposure. You're going to gain leads, and the most important thing, you're going to gain goodwill. People remember goodwill. All of you people that are on this line tonight, anybody that's listening to this video, if it's a month from now and I've broadcasted this video out, what is this doing to our community of photography? It's giving away my time, Joe's time, goodwill, okay? And that goes a long way, okay? When I first gave you my first video, it was done to have you get some value and get to know me before you ever felt like, you know, putting your hand in your pocket and paying me anything, okay? And some of you on this call, quite frankly, might not have paid me anything right now, okay? You might not be a customer yet. You might be just a, a lead, right? A, a person that came in that wanted to learn and, and wanted to take some of our free information. And that's fine. I'm okay with that because I know the more value I keep adding, eventually, you're going to want further training and hopefully you'll come back to me. So that's the goodwill, okay? And it's very important. It works in all businesses, Okay, if you have a side business other than photography right now, everything I'm telling you right now can work in that business too. This isn't just one size fits all, okay? I mean, it is a one size fits all, I'm sorry. It's not a one, you know, one item for one business. It's a one size fits all. It, it'll work for anything, okay? So that's really what you want to do. But the, the, the bottom one, the, the gaining goodwill is huge, okay? The exposure is great, the leads are great, but the gaining goodwill is awesome because people are going to talk about that, and that's when that, that word of mouth really starts to go virally, okay? Okay, next question. How do I find businesses? That's another big question that I'm going to get asked if I don't clear it up right now. And this is where it gets really exciting because we're getting into the, the really, really uh, uh, good little tip here that I came up with, and, uh, and it has to do with the yellow pages, but we'll get there in a minute. So how do I get more clients on a budget? How do I find these JV partners? You search your yellow pages, okay? If you still have the yellow pages, don't throw it out, okay? I know you probably don't use it right now because most of us don't, but if you do have it, 
use the businesses that are already in there to find them. It's, it's a Rolodex of businesses that could support your business. So go through there and find businesses that can complement your business. Okay, and that's what I say right here. Okay, so search for businesses that could benefit your, from your services. You want to call them, mail them, email them, and explain how you can help them give to their clients. Now, remember what I just said right there, how, how they can give them value. Okay, so make it about them and not you and list the benefits their businesses will receive. That's important. It's crucial. Okay, because you do not, and I'm going to say this again, you do not want it to be all about you. You want it to be about them. And if you show them that you're going to add value, yes, they know you're going to get something out of the deal eventually, but you're going to give them value up front. And that's important. It's really important. Joe, before I go into this next part, you want to add anything? No, I, I enjoyed your lengthy a a um, answer. I uh, took a trip to the fridge. <laughs> no, I had a but, glass of water there. Um, no, I mean, I basically throw away my yellow pages. It's just uh, more stuff, and I just put it in the paper recycle uh, bin. Um, I think you're going to tell us what, what's the future, and it's not going to be printed anything. I think everything is going to be off your monitor screen. I think we're going to get newspapers and magazines and everything coming off our um, computer screens, and that's the future. Yeah, and, and let, let me just let me just say, I, I kind of realized this the other day before I even discovered this was, you know, I went to go look up a phone number or something, and I went right to the computer, I went right to Google, and I started typing in what I wanted to search for. Okay, and then all of a sudden it comes up, and I find the number I want. I didn't go to Yellow Pages. I didn't go to, uh, you know, the Capital District phone book. I went to Google, and I, I typed in what I was looking for, and I forget what it was. It might even been a restaurant, Red Lobster, Albany or something. And, uh, and I went ahead, and I found the number, and I called. Okay, but here, here's what I wanted to share with everyone. It's something called Google Places. All right, now, if you've heard of this, congratulations. And the next thing I would say is, have you signed up yet? Okay. It's free. It's called Google Places. And this is going to replace the yellow pages. And I just want to say that on the record right now. Because this right here, Google is allowing all businesses in any area to list their business for free. Okay. You can see it right there. It says list your business. I'm not going to go through the sign up process. Just go there, sign up. Make sure you put in all your information. I'm going to show you right now why it's important to put in certain information. But what's going to happen here is it's going to be local searches. Okay? And you used to have to pay for this with the Yellow Pages. The Yellow Pages was charging like $75 a month just for a listing in Google. Okay? When they, when, when most people don't realize that you can get listed on Google just by putting up your site and putting in the right keywords for your area. I, I did that in the NPB course where you put up a YouTube video and you put your, you know, like if I was a wedding photographer, it would be wedding photographer in Albany, you know, creates great portraits or something. But the key is wedding photographer in Albany because that's what's going to get searched for and then Google is going to find that and it's more direct, it's more, it's more targeted, all right? But this here, Google Places, is Google's web territory. It's their property. So are they going to rank that better than just a page that's hosted on HostGator or, you know, one-on-one -on -one or, or any of them? It, it's going to basically take their property and it's going to post that first, okay? So let me get into this now. Right here, if you, let me zoom in on this because I want you to see this. If you see this right here, you can see it says Wedding Photographer Albany, New York. Okay, because if I was a photographer, or if I was, I'm sorry, if I wasn't a photographer, if I was someone getting married, and I live in Albany, or I live in the area, the capital district for us, which is a 50-mile, 60-mile radius, I wouldn't type in just wedding photographer. I'd put in wedding photographer Albany, right? And if you were in, Joe, if you were in Fort Lauderdale, the wedding photographer Fort Lauderdale, because you exactly. know you don't, you don't want a photographer coming from Albany to Fort Lauderdale, you know, they're not going to do it. And if they did, it's going to be thousands upon thousands of dollars to do it, all right? So most people are going to search for this when they're searching for that. Family photographer for Albany, you know, children's photography, Albany, pet photography, Albany, okay? All of those are going to come up like this. So let me go through this real quick with you. I want you to pay attention to this right here where it's got the A and it's like a little bubble, the B, the little bubble, and the C, the little bubble, okay? What that basically is is these are Google Places. These are sites that are registered with Google and they've created their own piece of property. They've staked their ground, let's say, all right? Now, these people haven't, okay, but I'm sure these people will get bumped out as soon as more people 
put on Google Places, then this whole page will be filled with Google Places. And if you're in the Albany area, I'm, I'm in Albany, but I'm not a wedding photographer, so I personally wouldn't be doing that. But if I was, I guarantee I could be right in here, or at least down here. These might slide up and I might go down, and that's fine. Okay? But what I'm saying is, is it's territory. It's real estate. You want to be there because, again, people aren't going to the yellow pages. They're going here. And this is where you would just go and put in wedding photographer Albany, and then boom, you'd come up or your area, and then this would be your your uh, you know your basically your site. The other cool thing is I can't do it here because this isn't live. This is like a screenshot. But I notice when you hover over the wedding photographer link anywhere that has one of those little bubbles, it actually it actually takes a pop up window and it puts your website in it. So it's like they roll over it, and all of a sudden your website pops up. Okay, so that's pretty cool too. All right, so let me scroll this back down again because I want to show you something else that's really cool. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so now let me go to the next slide real quick. Now this here is just a close-up of what also comes up, right? This is like Google Maps. Like Google Maps is like huge now, right? Everybody's using Google Maps. Now you see A, B, and C, but you see all these little dots right here? These are businesses that haven't been claimed yet. These, have, these businesses haven't registered with Google Places. So seven businesses listed in, in business phone numbers, I mean, and three, three of them have done the Google Places listing, okay? So the Google Places will show up in Google local results, right? That's what, the, that's what I'm trying to get a, a, across here. Now let me just say, I know for a fact that there is more photographers, more wedding photographers in Albany than seven, okay? But let me say something. The reason why we're not seeing them is because they don't have a business phone number. Some businesses or some photographers, they use their personal line. So they're not getting a business line, so they're not showing up as a business. So one thing, if you, if you, if you don't want to do Google Places, which I don't know why you wouldn't want to, get a business phone. You're going to have to pay monthly for that, but you, at least you'll get in here where you're in the directory now. Okay. Number two, get a Google Places, and you'll be becoming one of those big bubbles, the A, B, and the C. Okay? You'll, you could be D. Okay, but what I'm saying here is that there's probably 30, maybe 40 wedding photographers that could be filling up this space, but they don't have business lines. And to me, honestly, they're not smart enough right now. They don't know about this stuff. Okay, and maybe they're content with the business that they have. But right now, this is like cutting edge. This is something that I think is going to replace the yellow pages, and it's going to happen really, really soon. And Google is doing it because why does Google want to do this? Because they want to have everybody come to their site and search locally for their stuff. So they can be basically, you know, they can cover all aspects of searching, whether it's information, whether it's the phone book, whether it's doing email, whether, you know, any of that stuff. They even have docs now where you can do like document stuff online. They have everything because they're trying to take over and they're going to, okay? So that's very huge, okay? So Google Place is very, very important. Okay. Scott, can I, if, say, can I say something here? Yeah, go ahead. Um, to, if I want to be a bubble, do I have to pay Google any different, any more money? No. All you have so, to do is stake your ground. Oh, because I'd rather be a bubble than a dot. Exactly. And if you're a dot, that means that you're just a phone, you're a phone number, and and basically, uh, you know, you'll get picked up because you're a phone number, and basically that gets submitted by the the phone books, you know, the yellow pages and the telephone companies and stuff like that. But yeah, if you're a bubble. If you're a bubble, that means that you have a Google Places account. And it's real simple to do. And I gave you the, the, the URL right here is places.google.com forward slash, uh, slash business. Now, you can just search Google Places, and it will come right up top of the search, and then just go through it, and, and I would do that. But the main thing is, is just if you're a wedding photographer, put, make sure you put wedding photographer in or photography in the headline. Describe it in the details of everything that you do. If you do children too, put that in there, specializing in weddings slash children slash pet, you know, and then put it in there, photography, studio, put that in there because some people do photography studio. And you want to cover all those keywords that people search for. Um, really, really important. But as you can see on the left, that's the old way. The new way is Google, and I think that's going to basically take over, and the Yellow Pages is going to be obsolete. Right now, keep a hold of the Yellow Pages so you can go and find some JVs to work with. I think that's a valuable tool for that, and it doesn't cost you anything to do that as, you know, as well. You know, so I would definitely, definitely consider doing that. Okay, but um, let's take a few. Uh, let's take a few questions. <coughs> Judy, are you there? Oh, we're doing fine. Um, okay. I have some questions. If, do you want to cover those now? Do you have time? Yeah, let's let's start with. Uh, you know, we'll see what kind of time we're running. But yeah, give us one at a time, and then we'll uh, we'll see where we're at. 
Okay, way back early on, Tom asked, when I use a white background and cut out the subject, around the edge of the subject is lighter. And that was it. Okay. Um, it's a real a real simple one. Uh, that there, what I would say is what's probably happening is, is the edge is not getting um, is not getting uh, clipped properly. And a, a simple way to do that, I can't really explain it on here unless I could actually show you my computer monitor, um, but I can't. But basically, um, there's an expand feature under the select. And uh, maybe I'll have to do an, an additional video for this, but there's an expand um, and contract option. It's near the feather option. And basically, if you create your selection and then hit expand, it will basically allow it to come in further by however many pixels you allow it to. So it could be one pixel, two pixels, three pixels. And then basically what happens there is um, it will take that edge, it will get closer to the edge than what your selection was. So it can kind of, you can kind of like nibble away at the edge until you see that white go away. Um, I would advise doing the expand and then at the same time doing the feather and using the feather at one or a two pixel feather. So that's the answer to that one. Scott, would you say that uh, perhaps a, a dingy white or a dull white or a gray background would be preferable for the cutouts? Yeah, I, you know, I see that a lot too, is a lot of people will want to get a high key shot, and that's great, but a lot of times the light is pushing off of the background and, and bleeding onto the back of the subject, and that's not necessarily the best thing, because now you have a lot of the white spill on the, on the arm that wraps around, like Joe was saying, the light wraps, so you want to be careful with that. So, um, yeah, I'd say try not to get it where it's a high key background, try to get it where it was more of, like Joe was saying, like a dingy white or a gray and then from there it will make your selection process a lot easier. Next question. Okay, this is from Jean. Great points on the direction of the lighting. The only thing though here is that the baby's facial expression and posture is exactly the same in both pictures. I wonder if the background was digitally replaced. Oh, I see what she's saying. Now, I think mm -hmm. we use levels in Photoshop and darken the black background, but we don't want to do that if we shoot 100 pictures during that session. It's preferable, and me and a lot of other instructors always say, and you'll hear it, get it right in the camera and do less time in Photoshop at the end in post. So that was just an example to show you that it was a gray background, but levels in Photoshop could help you darken it. But you don't want to do that to 100 uh, images to uh, show the client for her uh, proofs. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, next question. From Dell, Scott, what is the power source? I believe this was uh, on the one in the minivan. Oh, the power source for that? What, what did huh? she use for that, Joe? Do you know? Do you, did she run a lead port from her house? What, what did she do? I, I don't know exactly if she was at a shopping center or where she was. She could use a uh, long extension cord. Um, there are battery-operated uh, strobes. You could use your uh, speed light. Um, she's not firing an awful lot. She's not very far away. She doesn't have to drain the batteries in the speed light and your hot shoe flash. Uh, anything that you can put in a uh, softbox. Uh, Photoplex makes a, a little 12 by 16 inch softbox. Uh, Last Delight makes a 15 by 15 inch square. She had a 24 by 24. So there's other ways to do it besides Studio Strobe. You could use a portable battery uh, operator. The idea is that um, a studio is anywhere you make it. If you're capable of putting out a good product, you can call that a, any, a studio. It's a studio quality picture. That's all people are going to see is the end, not how you took it or where you were. Exactly. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I, I would say, you know, in that case, as far as, I mean, you can get little mini generators nowadays. You can charge it up. You don't even have to, not even a gas one. It's like when you plug in overnight and to fire a strobe, there'd be nothing. And I think I've seen them for, you know, under, under 60 bucks. You know, if you had to do that, but normally you have electric electricity near that. But if you had to, you could always do that. And honestly, uh, you can actually probably use your uh, the, the cigarette lighter that people have, and you can get an adapter for a 12 volt on that. Next question. Okay, this is from Dean. He said, "Should I charge full price to my friends or use them as a marketing tool?" I think marketing tool. I think definitely a marketing tool. And, um, you know, you may want to say in the future, you can't do that for them all the time, but as you're getting started, you can do it for them. And then in the future, you can tell them they'll always get 50% off. 
Okay. That's what I would. That's what I would suggest. And and the same thing goes like family and friends because sometimes you can get you can start getting taken advantage of. Um, trust me, I know. And uh, you can basically um, from there just say straight across the board. You know, everybody pays fifty percent. I think that's fair. And if people, if your family doesn't want to help support you, you know, in a way that you know that's your living, then you know, shame on them. Next question. Okay, there had been comments in the chat about. Uh, photographs being stolen from different places, from Facebook or websites. And Dell asks, he'd like for you to comment on that problem, the photos being stolen from customers. Um, okay, I, I got a good, uh, I've got a good answer for that. Um, number one, if the images are stolen, um, meaning that they were copied to someone's computer, if they're on Facebook, they're going to be a lower resolution. Okay, it's a web image. And if they go to print that, it's not going to look good. Okay, and I get it that some people are going to do that. They're going to try to print it, and they might be okay with that. But you know what? You can't stress about that. You can't worry about that. What I would say is make sure that you put your your uh, your copyright and your um, business logo on the front, and then let people take it and pass it around Facebook. You know, let everybody see it. You know what I mean? So it's not such a bad thing because in there you're going to have some type of branding of your of your uh, studio. You know, or you might even want to put right on the front there your website. You know, that way there, everybody that passes along, they might stumble on your website too. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but so many people panic about people stealing their work, and you can't you can't worry about that. You know, I, I would I would again to me I would worry more about just going and getting more clients, getting more happy clients because if you have a happy client, they're going to want to pay you regardless, and they're not going to want to steal from you. Is it going to happen occasionally? Yes, but the thing is, is you can't stress about that day in and day out. Um, like I said, most people are honest people, especially if you're good to them and if you've created some of that goodwill, as I talked about before. Because again, like I know there's people right now that have done that to me. You know, I mean, even not even in brick and mortar business, but even online. You know, they, I, I give out a, a, a guarantee with all my stuff. And I have a handful, handful of people that say, you know, I, I want a refund for whatever reason. I give it to them straight, straight about, no problem. But the thing is, I know that they copied the stuff, and I know, you know, but, you know, I can't worry about that. Okay, all I can worry about is making everybody that I have, um, that I'm teaching or that I'm taking pictures of, to make them happy, and to let the rest take care of itself. So I know it was a long-winded answer. I say if they're going to do it on Facebook, you know what? Make sure there's a little a little uh, logo for you there, and hopefully people hit the like button, and then it keeps getting spread around, because then you can get a lot of publicity. Does that apply for screenshots they might take also? Totally. Screenshots only 72 DPI. When you okay. take a screenshot, when you take a screenshot of your of your computer monitor, it's 72 DPI, and 72 okay. DPI is going to be very very low quality. If you even upload that to to a place, that it's going to come up and say that the quality is not good enough to print. Okay, another one from AG says, Hi, thanks. I really enjoyed now that I learned how to make sharp background in photography. How do I make my washed out black background sharp black in Photoshop? You said levels. How do I keep the face light? You used the layer, then you Scott, and then you brought it back in. Yeah, I, I I do. I don't do a mask. A lot of people will do a mask. Um, you can create a layer mask and then do it that way. I usually just make a duplicate layer, and then the top layer is the one that I will lighten, and then I'll just erase the elements that I want to basically bring back. But I know some people are probably listening to this saying like, "Oh, that's you know, that's not really a great way of doing it. You should probably do it in mask." It's the same difference. It's just a whole, it's just a different way of doing it. But that's how I do it. But yeah, you're gonna preserve you know, the skin tones and all that stuff when you over lighten it or you, you darken it and then you want to bring back the actual true color to that. So that's really how you do that. And actually there was a video I did of that whew, probably about two years ago. It's floating around there somewhere. Maybe I should uh, update that one and maybe put that one back out again and that can help people that if you get, you know, if that situation happens then you'll have a fix for it. But like Joe said, try to fix it before that even happens. Any more? One more from Cindy. She's asking, what about modeling releases? Do we need one for everyone we shoot and put on our website? Um, I say yes. What, all right, well, you can answer. But what I do is I have my wedding price list or my portrait price list, and it has, believe it or not, a little model release at the bottom. And when they sign that, they've signed the model release. 
Now, I may show it and point it out to them, but when they're si signing the order for the work order or the, um, you know, I've got their model release on that invoice. Scott? Yeah, no, I, I, same, same thing. I mean, you should just make that part of your documentation. And, you know, they don't have to sign it. You know, it's, you aren't going to say, well, if you don't sign it, I'm not going to take the pictures. It's more or less a courtesy thing to say, hey, look, if I want to be using these in my marketing, would it be okay? And some people will be flattered. Most people will, actually. And some people will be like, no, I don't want you to. You know, so you got to be careful because you got to cover yourself. But in the same breath, most people are honored that you would possibly use them. And that's another great point. Marketing wise, you know, I say, number one, everybody should have a blog. If you listen to this, you have a website, you don't have a blog, get a blog because there's a lot of benefits to it. Again, I can have a whole webinar on that. But the main things with that is people can comment. And when people can comment, it's great because now you can put a week's worth of pictures up. You can say, you know, my favorite shoots from this week and it updates. So this way here, you're updating your blog all the time and you get people that want to come back and read it because people love seeing pictures. And especially if you say, hey, I just uploaded my favorite shots from this week. Well, then someone's going to, uh, you know, those people that came during the week are going to see if they're on there. And then if they're on there, they're going to forward it over to their mother, their father, their, you know, friends and family over on Facebook. And then everybody's going to start passing it around. It's a viral engine right there. So use that. And, um, you know, like I said, I mean, you just, you, you want to make sure that you can make it so people can share, you know, these images. And a blog is a great way to do it. Facebook is a great way to do it. All right, Scott, we're at 930 now. Yeah, um, I, I think I think we're going to have to wrap this up. Um, it's 930. We went a half hour over. So um, that's it. That's uh, pretty much going to wrap up this webinar. Thanks, everyone, for sticking with us this far. I know it's been a long call. I, I hope you got a lot out of it. I hope you took notes. If you didn't, I'm going to do my best to get this webinar out the recording as soon as possible and I'll probably end up even giving an audio too because I know some people like the audio and some people like to watch the video so I'll maybe give both versions of it but again that's going to be free so I will give you um, access to this again in a recording so I just want to thank everyone for showing up thanks uh, again Judy for uh, bailing us out with the uh, chat box down below right. Becky I see you on I thank you for being on and I thank everyone for uh, again being on this call for this long and I hope you got a lot out of it everyone have a great um, a great night and a great holiday season and uh, we'll talk to everyone Scott? real soon yeah what's up Joe? Scott I just want to say it was my pleasure tonight I, we enjoyed these questions and it just keeps us on our toes so um, please anything you have uh, to offer and, and ask questions we'll be here yeah, absolutely. We're always here, and if you, we're just an email away. So that's it. That's going to wrap up this video, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks for showing up, and good luck and happy shooting. Take care.